Hello. So uh, my name is Roxy Rizvani, and I'm here to talk to you today about the making of a film called Little Pyongyang, as Alex said. I am a filmmaker, and I work as a director and producer in London. This is me. <laughs> um, so I grew up in London as well, specifically in northwest London in a place called Dollis Hill with my mum and sister. And I've always grown up loving art and stories and films, but I never went to film school. So a lot of how I've had to learn my craft per se has come through just jobbing and having to learn as I go. Uh, luckily with the patience of a lot of like colleagues and friends who've helped me learn things along the way. And uh, in my career, I guess so far, I've worked, oh, had the benefit of working with a lot of different brands, uh, companies, galleries, and in particular, a lot of uh, the work I'd done to date before doing Little Pyongyang had been through working in television. And I guess one of the most formative projects that I'd worked on was a TV series that I made whilst I was working at Vice called Gaycation. And it was led by an actress called Ellen Page. Uh, in light of her coming out. And where it's where we went around to different countries around the world and looked at the nuances of the LGBT culture and cultural identity in different countries. And for me, it was such a formative experience because I think it really taught me what's at the core of what I've tried to take forward with my own filmmaking, which is really like a responsibility towards the people that you're working with and the stories that you're telling and really learning how to build relationships with people that um, are more than just superficial. So what is Little Pyongyang? Well, I'm not sure if anyone here has watched it yet, but the film is essentially about uh, a North Korean refugee called Jung Wah Choi. And he lives today in a little suburb of London called New Malden, where his greatest challenges essentially are getting by day to day and being the father of two kids, or three kids, but uh, he was formerly a soldier in the North Korean army. Uh, and his dilemma really is the fact that whilst I think a lot of the people think of a refugee narrative as you were in a bad situation, you left that situation, you come to safety and everything's okay, his d dilemma is that he still feels incomplete. And a lot of that comes to do with the fact that he does really want to return home. Um, and so for those, before I keep talking about the film, that haven't seen it, I've got a little trailer to play for you now. I don't know if it's hard or hard, but the environment is very difficult. So one of the first questions that people ask me uh, when they hear about the project is, um, how did you come across North Koreans living in the UK? And uh, it really begins in New Malden, which is where uh, the largest community of North Korean defectors live, not only in the UK and Europe, but it's one of the largest and the highest concentration of defectors living together outside of Korea itself. Um, but a lot of people then ask me, well, how did you come across New Malden? It's a really nondescript place. Not a lot of people have heard of it, but it's essentially because it is home also to my partner of many years, and it's where he grew up and um, still part-time lives today. And it's known for having one of uh, already like a very big Korean community in London. There are lots of shops. There's a big supermarket and... Uh, Getting to know, like the the idea was that as I spent more and more time there, and I got to know Koreans living in the community that were primarily from South Korea, more and more people would talk about North Koreans, but in these really incidental ways. 
And it was like one day when we were having dinner and my partner's brother came home and he kind of announced to the table, do you know, my best friend June, he's not just Korean, he's North Korean. And, um, and his parents dismissed it as something where they were just like, oh, this is like a young kid uh, t telling stories. But um, it was, again, the first time, or I was almost surprised that I had never really thought about the fact that there was a North Korean diaspora and that there were refugees living in London. And so, as I said, I, I just got to normal people, talked to people about it, and then soon enough, I had made friends with members of the community in New Malden and came to discussing a film. So I was drawn to the project, as I just described, not as a journalist who in the first place had wanted to cover North Korea and therefore after that tried to seek out North Koreans, but rather through these conversations that I was having with people day to day. And a big thing that came across for me was the frustrations that people had with the coverage in the West of North Korea. Usually when we do see North Korea covered in the headlines, it's through things, it's generally through stories about the leaders. So it'll be about Kim Jong, formerly Kim Jong-il, today Kim Jong-un, and it'll be things like, look at their silly haircuts, look at the ridiculous food they eat, they're overweight, and you know, it, it'll be very superficial things, and occasionally maybe things about the nuclear program, and then again as a postscript to that, maybe mentions about the human rights crisis there. And again, as I had more conversations with North Koreans in the community, they would talk about how they felt that all the portrayals of themselves that they were seeing were of people that were brainwashed or people that weren't really human. And w essentially when I heard these things, it was, I kind of felt almost a guilt on behalf of someone that was calling themselves a filmmaker and a, a journalist or at least part of uh, the industry at that point and how we could have done so wrong by a community that that's how they felt. And so as a result of that, I thought, well, with what skills that I have, I, I, I want to do something to change that. So again, the, one of the next questions that people ask me when they then look at the project was, where did the inspiration from the designs come from? And what I'd say is that a lot of my approach to this film um, came essentially as part of a like problem-solving process. So in the same way that a lot of the inspiration and motivation for making the film in the first place was to solve a problem, which was like the portrayal of North Koreans. Uh, similarly, when uh, I wanted to approach how I'd put the film together, it was, um, it was that kind of approach. Because uh, when people ask me, wow, it, the, the project took four years, why was that? I tell people like, and, and they'd assume a lot of it was um, getting people essentially to come on board as North Koreans to tell their stories. I'd say no, actually. The, the minute that they were sharing these stories with me and kind of encouraging me to, to write the wrong in the portrayals, that, was, um, that happened quite quickly and through, quite, um, quite quickly through our conversations. But instead, what really took time was finding people that would want to invest in the project, to hear their stories, despite the fact that I would say that we have a real deficit of portrayals of North Koreans and information about North Korea generally. And that really surprised me. And so I would be going to funders, commissioners, broadcasters, and talking to them about Jung Hwa and talking to them about the community, and yet no one seemed interested. And so when I, again, I, when I was trying to unpack that myself and listening to the feedback I was getting. Essentially what I was hearing was, well, this is just another story about some refugees. What are, you know, what are they doing? Are they doing anything different? And, I, and again, what it built up in me was this continued frustration of like, wow, I don't understand. I still don't understand why people don't think that their voices alone and story alone are enough. And so essentially when coming back to this question of where did the inspiration for the designs came from, first and foremost, it was to, to kind of come up with a way that the film itself could ensure that no one would dismiss the story that people wouldn't be able to ignore what it is that Jung Hwa was saying when we were filming. And I kind of used that as my guiding light going forward for all the decisions I was making with the aesthetic. But with that in mind, um, and actually picking out references and, and thinking exactly of how the design would work and what it would be communicating, I'd say first and foremost, I turned to an artist uh, whose work I really respect. Um, and that is Ai Weiwei. 
And I think for me, what's incredible about Ai Weiwei and the work that he does is not only do people know him as an activist and as someone that is really uncompromising in his message of fighting human rights abuses and people um, and for people's freedom, but also that I think his the art he's producing itself is incredibly complex, well thought out, and he sort of almost enjoys the labor of time that it takes to create uh, the artworks. And in particular, I think what else that he does so well that I really wanted to channel into this piece was, I'd say, essentially take very personal experiences and the richness of a lived experience, but also combine that with something that is tr truthful and that we should see as factual and we should see as undeniable. And that is something that I think that's a real problem that North Koreans have to grapple with. And as I said, I really wanted to bring to the project as part of making something that uh, essentially would really bring attention to their stories. And then the other place that I looked for inspiration for references for the design was North Korea itself. And I began firstly with looking at any of the photographs that I could find of actual North Korean homes. And as you can see here, I'm assuming that most of these were actually taken from Pyongyang because that's where people um, have access when they do as journalists. But you could even see in the different homes that were um, being captured there that there were features that were kind of coming up quite frequently in the design and little intricacies that I found so interesting um, that I thought that I really wanted to bring to the piece. Because I felt it was, again, very important that these stories would be heard and represented and depicted within a space that was recognizable to Jinghua, but I never at the same time wanted it to be um, an exact recreation. And then the other place that I looked was at the architecture and design of North Korea as the state wanted to portray itself. And the um, photographs that you see here that have all been taken by an amazing journalist called Ollie Wainwright, I think really depicts something that is, has kind of contributed to why we have this very difficult relationship with North Korea. Because on the one hand, you're looking at these things that are, it, for me at least, in terms of visual terms, just they are interesting, they are beautiful, but at the same time, they are obviously like a distraction from what's also going on in the country with its citizens. And so that's why, again, like as part of that and part of my inspiration was, well, how do we take that and turn that on its head, as I said, and kind of make it not a distraction and, in fact, what is drawing you in to hear the voices of people? So what were the designs? <laughs> well, I had the help of an amazing team to put together all the designs that I work with. Uh, we work with uh, an amazing production designer called Kat Hawker, a set designer called Louis Gibson, and designers who were working on the graphics and particular props that we were making up, Erica Dawn and Maya Baduk Epstein. And I also had the help of some amazing producers as well. Um, and uh, it was basically a lot of like begging, borrowing, and having to pull stuff together to make it work. Because, um, because whilst you can have these big ideas right in theory, uh, documentaries are not the uh, best funded filmmaking art form. And the first uh, set, that design that we came up with and also was kind of integral to the film was the space in which we would do the master interview with Zheng Hua. And that's the design that you see here. And the idea, first and foremost, was to create a space in which you would be drawn to him, as I was saying, but also would kind of uncannily feel midway between this idea of like a homely space, but at the same time something where you would get the sense that things weren't sitting quite perfectly. And hopefully you can see where the references were coming into it, but also for us, obviously a big decision was when we made the decision to go with pink as the color that would thematically run through the film and, and all our sets. And for me, again, it kind of comes back to what I was saying with this idea of how North Korea decides to portray itself in relation to the state. And pink is a color that seems to come up in a lot of the propaganda and in a lot of their own design. And even in, for example, the sort of sartorial choices of one of their major newsreaders whenever she reads out 
um, big iconic events on their state news broadcasters, she's always wearing pink. And so yet again, I was like, this is a way in which this color clearly means something to them and is part of the way that they represent um, the regime. And so I thought, what better way to bring that back into the film and bring that back into what Junghua's statement was than to kind of unashamedly use that through the film. The next uh, set design that we came up with is essentially expanding the world of uh, the constructed scenes to this living room. And here again, as I said, you can kind of see where we were trying to bring in elements from the references. But also the idea is that within that room, each and every object relates to a specific story or experience that Junghua shared with us, not all of which make it into the film, but the idea was that I really wanted everything in that space to carry meaning and be something that whilst constructed and, you know, in that sense, quote unquote, false, it would have a realness that when he himself would even be looking at that, it would be like laden with meaning. And then the last set that we came up with was this dining room. For me, food is a really, really important part of immigrant cultures, but also is really significant, I think, to displaced people. I think that's a lot of the fact is because food in and of itself is something that you can experience, you know, and interact with that can remind you of home. But more so than that, I think it's so important that the act of like cooking and eating and sharing that with people is one that is not passive, but one that you are a part of. And you are a part of creating whilst also drawing from the past. And it was also a really easy way, I think, that when I was talking to Njungwa about North Korea and really wanting to create a space where he felt safe to share stories and did not only feel the pressure to share stories that were um, negative, that he could convey, a, a, again, in essence, this, the nostalgia and just the experience of growing up there and what that place meant to him through food and through telling me about his favorite childhood dishes or things that his family would cook or things that he remembers. But at the same time, it was indeed like a gateway to some of the problems that were at the forefront of what he faced and a lot of other North Korean defectors face, um, which were problems of starvation And last but not least, some of the designs that we incorporated into the film came through the specific graphics that we were putting together for individualized props. And for example, here we have this tin can that was designed by the graphic designer, Erica Dawn. Or another example is this matchbox, which my Baduk Epstein put together, which features, again, uh, iconography from North Korea. And the idea for me was that not only would they just add to, again, really drawing audiences into the world. But more importantly as well, I think, hopefully help to serve to really try and draw audiences into the whole experience of what it is like to be someone who is carrying a traumatic experience with you through, but having to power through. And by that, what I mean is that even individual objects can, one, remind you of home, but also remind you of experiences that people may never have attached to something as innocuous as a matchbox. But was it more than window dressing? Well, I'd say to people first and foremost that they can watch the film and decide. But, um, but again, in terms of going deeper into my intention, at least when I was bringing this to the project and really deciding on using uh, these specially crafted designs as part of the visual storytelling, um, what I really did want them to be was more than illustrations and more than recreations but actually part of how I was encouraging an audience to take in uh, Jungwa's story. So I thought, again, to explain that a little bit better, I'd show you a clip and then um, explain, the process as, uh, explain the process as a filmmaker of how I integrated the designs to his story. Mosul 
읽고 갈 때는 그랬던 게 있습니다. 그래서 아 이익이라는 것이 어릴 때도 음, 존재하는구나 하는 걸그 그 북한 사회였지만 그래도 거기서 자기 노력으로 어떤 기술로서 따서 먹었던 응? 그런 음. 기억들은 뭐 인간이 본능적인 게 아니었을까 예, 그런 생각들을 합니다. So as you can imagine, the first time that I heard that story, for me it was one of those moments where I was just like, for me it was kind of like one of those moments where I was kind of thinking this is like stranger than fiction or better than fiction. In the way that I felt that what he was really sharing through just telling me that story about his childhood was an insight that was so layered and so deep and carried so many meanings as to his relationship with where he'd come from. that. I actually thought that the best thing that I could do as a filmmaker was to not interrupt that. So as you see there from that clip, we just let him tell you the story. And again, that was part of also trying to on purpose use this device of him talking straight down the lens so that you didn't feel that there was anything stopping you feeling like you were just having a conversation with him and connecting with him. But instead, what I then wanted to do was take this story about Mochigi, the game with the nails and the chalk, and the idea was to say, whilst I want the audience to take that in and listen to that story and, and react to that as they want, the most that I can do as a filmmaker is that as the film goes on and you learn different things that have happened to him and you see him react to different things that are happening in his life, to just bring that back and throw that story back in so that people can again, as they wish, think about how that story and that relationship with North Korea has affected and impacted his day-to-day -day in these different situations. And so what we did is we took then this image that we constructed, and you'll see it come back through the film at particular turning points in order to kind of show that wholeness of being and wholeness of experience. And similarly, the last thing that I'll talk about is, again, is, is this image. It's um, a postcard of North Korea that it's a vintage postcard that I actually found on eBay. And for me, again, when I saw it, it was an image of North Korea that I thought was completely alien to me, or the information that I'd been provided and the kind of images that I was seeing of North Korea. And it felt, obviously, it looks, it, it looks beautiful. And I really connected with it because, again, over time and over really understanding that the dilemma that North Korean defectors are in, when they are displaced especially, and as many of them have been, like Jung Hwa has now been here in the UK for 10 years, is that he's now, though he wants to go home and he wants everything to change, he's now raising a family here. He's now facing the prospect of essentially being here for the rest of his life. And with that comes a kind of new dilemma, and that is not only trying to retain your own memories and own sense of your identity, but thinking about how you pass that on to the next generation. And that in particular was something that struck a chord with me personally, because um, my own father is not from North Korea, but is displaced also. He is from Iran. And he hasn't had the opportunity to go back there since the 70s when there was political turmoil there. So, and I've never been myself either. So similarly for Jung Hwa's kids, or oh, similarly to Jung Hwa's kids and a lot of other kids of refugees, Iran for me only exists through the media and what I get from the UK or America or any English speaking sources through stories and poetry and film and also through my relatives and my father. And in that way again, as I said, as I've said it growing up is that I had to sort of build up my own filter to what was coming in and not let that affect me or affect the possible positive relationship that I could have with my heritage whilst also acknowledging the politics of a state. And as I connected with that and again, like tried to channel that into what I was doing with the film and, and how I could relate that to Jung Hwa and also try to convey that within the film. It, for some reason, it all came flooding to me with this image because, again, it was this thing that I was like, oh, like, if you were North Korean and you were living in the UK, you never get shown this kind of image in relation to North Korea. And so it is an image that we use to bookend the beginning and end of the film because, and, and for me, it really came from that and also something that Jung Hwa said to me that isn't in the film, but 
he said at one point that his relationship with North Korea and waiting for it to change, he said, is like chasing Eden. And it's the idea that it's this place that you can see and you can feel and you know really well, but at the same time, it's very difficult communicating that to other people. And simultaneously, as you change and you go through your life and you get new information and you build new relationships with your family, with your friends, that image of Eden at once being really clear and, uh, and existing is also at the same time incredibly intangible and ever-changing and adaptable. And so again, like the reason we bookended the film with that was this idea of like essentially showing that whilst the film gives you a really clear idea of where this man is now and what his story is, at the same time, it's again up to the viewer to take what they will from it and also understand that this is part of a changing and ongoing journey. So what has the reaction been to the film? Um, so the film uh, first premiered uh, in competition at a film festival called CPH Docs and has since gone through a few different festivals and screenings from the, in the UK and in, in America, but I guess it really had its biggest outing when it went online a month ago. Um, obviously, the reaction that I have received has been incredibly positive in Jungwa too, but I thought that it's, I'm cynical, so it's one thing people coming up to you and, and giving you positive feedback, but it's another when they don't know you and, you and you're not in the room. So I thought the best place to look for really unfettered reactions to the film was to look at the YouTube and Reddit comments. And when I did, even though people advise you not to, I was actually really pleasantly surprised. And though I've like, I, you know, this is, this is me selecting some, again, people can go and, and read for themselves, but I was really overwhelmed with the fact that when people were reacting, they were genuinely reacting to North Korea. They were reacting to the particular dilemmas that jung was going through and the vulnerability that he was showing. And they were able to, again, like take essentially the messages on of the film. And then there were a lot of people who also really <laughs> did notice, surprisingly, the design, and they were drawing a lot of comparisons to Wes Anderson, which I obviously take as a massive compliment, but also, um, again, I find it funny because obviously Wes Anderson himself draws from a lot of Asian aesthetics, so I was partly frustrated being like, no, just go and look at, look at all the amazing creators and history of design and, and art in Asia. But again, it was... Um, it was great that it was something that people weren't resenting but engaging with. I did, however, have to, I feel like for balance, show you, and I'm grateful to say it was one of the few negative comments that we did get for the film. And as you can see here, um, <laughs> this person expressed real frustration with what they felt was not a journalistic endeavor and a film that didn't really tell you much about North Korea. But then when you ex expand that comment and you look at all the replies that it gets, I was very uh, pleased and, again, very happy that it was almost like all the rebuttals to that comment were like straight out of my treatment, where people were kind of advocating for the approach to this film that we took, which was, again, to essentially offer someone something different to what would have been the kind of journalistic film that you could get from any other broadcaster, but was something that given that I wanted to give this time and I was willing to, to put the time in and I felt that myself as an individual could, you know, bring something to it that people were responding to that. And lastly, the comments that made me feel the most, or my heart the most warmed were the ones where people were really reacting to jung the man himself, and really understanding what he'd been through. And essentially not just seeing this at the end of the day as like a refugee that people should feel sad about, but as someone and an individual that was striving for something that was strong and that was an individual. And so thank you very much for listening to the talk today. And if anyone does want to know any more information about North Koreans in the UK, I really advise that people look to a charity called Connect North Korea. And, um, and if you haven't watched the film, please do watch it and share it. Thank you very much.